going to be about the kid here, which at that point was in some distress and needed some help. And he came to me and asked me if I'd write a script for him. I said, well, yes, of course I will. And then I went back to my writing room and I said, what is a video script? How do you even do that? So I, I learned and I figured it out. We went down the river and uh, there and so forth. And I always intended to turn that into a book because what you can do in an hour program, even on something as great as public television, is it, only scratching the surface of the things that I really want to get in real life. And so I was uh, sitting in my office, um, I was chairing the department thinking, I can't afford to go to this place I wanted to go for two months and need to search for another kind of book. But, you know, right outside my window, a few miles down the street is the Cape River. I paddled that river, I sailed that river, I used that river for a hurricane hole. I once helped take the pride of Baltimore down that river and out to sea and down to Florida. You know, I had power boats on that river. I, I, my band has played on the old Henrietta Three, which was the third iteration of the original Henrietta Steamboat built in Bedville back in the 1830s. You know, and so I thought it's about time I took a look at this river and really did what I had said to do. So I sent off an email to David Perry at USC Press and I said, Look, I'm thinking about this river. Here's the kind of book I would get. Gave him about two pages, single space, and he wrote back within the hour. The only time in my entire professional career that an editor ever got to me that quickly about a project. And he said his words were, this is the kind of book we should be doing. So let's talk. And we came up with a way of doing it. And the way of doing it was really simple. The river flows one way. It goes from the headwaters to the sea. It, you could have done it the other way, but paddling all the way up that river would be something more sure. And the idea of the book is that it's one long journey, even though the journey took place probably a year and a half or so it took place. The first 65 miles of it, I paddled with a biologist a wildlife photographer, a river guide. And then at various times I came back with a biologist and went down the river in small boats and went off and paddled the side creeks, island creek, and town creek, and the rest. I went down with the river keeper, I was able to rise to my feet and go up here. And he kind of navigated me around the deer holes and what have you. I went tromping around on Bald Head Island to the actual Cape of Fear. And it was the most expensive trip of we, you know, we had to take the ferry boat out and the golf cart, <laughs> the whole thing. But it was really kind of interesting to have gone from the headwaters, which is just below the George Jordan Dam a few miles, all the way out to the Cape of Fear, where you can look out and see these tumultuous frothing breakers, and you can understand why they call it the Cape of Fear. So what I'd like to do is to give you a little bit about what I think I learned from this trip. And you're all scientists, so I'm not going to fill in the data. You're the only one, all many of you are. And you know much more about the specifics of how water quality is measured and the connectivity of species and contiguous habitat and all those things that are part of the river. But I will say that I looked at the river as a kind of arterial system. That is, the Cape Fear River is sort of the aorta of North Carolina. The terminal artery is a huge river. And I'm going to give you a couple of stats about it in a moment from the book, tell you just how big it is and why it matters. But if you think of it as this web of interconnected kind of circulatory system, not just the river and tributaries like Town Creek and Black River and South River and all the little rivers that get into it, but literally thousands of miles of ditches and runoff seeps and creeks and branches that all converge at the headwaters and actually form the river. You realize that you're talking about something very much like what happened in the human body. We have main arteries and we have veins and we have capillaries, and all of it is to get the nutrients to the cells. And I think of all of the wetlands along the river as the lungs, home there. They're breathing there. And so I want to kind of get and emphasize that point over and over again. It might be a simple one if you've actually studied any science to understand the interconnectivity of things, but it becomes quite a visceral when you're on the river. Let me start by reading two short pieces here and set the table for us. In the Cape Fear River it drains one of 17 river basins in North Carolina. But it's the only it's the only one of four rivers contained entirely within the border of the state, and the only one of the 17 that empties directly into the ocean. It spreads out over 9,322 square miles, almost 10,000 square miles cutting right through the heart of the state, containing in its drainage basin 116 towns and cities, 
In 26 of North Carolina, there's 100 counties, more than 40, covering 15% of the state and containing fully one fifth of its people, nearly a million souls. Runs inland like the main artery of history from the sea to the mountains. So that's the statistics that I think you need to know. Um, I want to give you one other little piece here. Nearly 200 miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean, the confluence of the deep and tall rivers come together. In the North Carolina Piedmont, literally at the foot of the mountains, lies a small wedge of beach called Mermaid Point. For more than 100 years now, it's been submerged by a hydroelectric dam just downstream, but the sandy bottom is still there. In the 1700s, when only a handful of white settlers made their home in the vast the basin, Travelers reported hearing beautiful, ghostly singing emanating from the beach. A legend grew up that this was the place where mermaids would gather under a full moon. They had swum up the river until it was cleansed of salt and clarified of the tea stains of cannon leaching from the cypress swamps in the lower river. To this beach, where the mountain cold water ran purified by 50 miles of fall and drift and sea. Through the watershed, spider webbing out north, east, and west. Here they would lounge, washing and combing each other's long hair, all the while eating their siren song in a lovely mesmerizing language no human ear could comprehend. So I thought of those, those mermaids and that, that fanciful story as I began going down the river. And I began to realize that a number of different threads were all contained in that. One of them, of course, is the undeniable environmental. I'm on the Cape Fear, board of the Cape Fear River Watch. We're concerned about one thing, the water quality of the Cape. So ecologically it's huge, gigantic river. I'll give you statistics later on about just how much water comes out of it every second that we get here. Uh, but I also realized that we think about history being something separate from the land. We think about culture as being something separate from history often. We think of politics as being an overlay that somehow exists outside of both history and culture and ecology. And we think of things like social justice as something we invented in the 20th century and that is sort of on top of all those things, but we always tend to think of those separately. And I came away from this trip from spending all this time in the water with all these smart people helping me to understand, not just the people I took with me, but the people I interviewed along the way, the people I had casual contact with, whether they were fishermen or lock masters, or other kinds of people. And, and something really hit me in a way that I always sort of knew in an abstract way, but really came home for the course of the trip, which is this. The river is all one thing. The river is all one thing. This seems like a simple enough context, and as a, any scientist here would say, well, of course, that goes without saying. But we don't treat it that way. Even the scientists don't treat it that way. So as a simple example, the Cape Fear River forms a county boundary throughout a lot of the region that it traverses. Um, so that it becomes a barrier between, say, New Hanover County and Brunswick County. Well, two counties have two separate boards that regulate development on either side of the river. They're not treating the river like one. And it goes through 26 different counties, in addition to the ones that it's bordering. So you have a hodgepodge of people trying to tell you what you can and can't do regarding the river. But the river is all one thing. You throw something in here, the water's everywhere. So, and the farther upstream you throw that thing in the river, whether that thing is silt or chemicals or coal ash or whatever it is, the more the bigger the footprint of it as it spreads out from the spider webbing of tributaries and what lands south. We don't treat it like one thing in another respect. We spent on the River Watch, I think it might have been five years altogether, fighting Titan Cement, an enormous company based in Greece that wanted to come to the Cape Fear, a northeast branch of the Cape Fear. Take a gigantic limestone pit to mine to get to make cement. And then to put up a, an operation there that would have done two things. It injected all kinds of water, millions of gallons of clean water into their operation, creating dirty water from it. And spewing out stuff into the air that we know from all the scientists who sit on the Cape Fear River Watch board will come right down into the water and something interesting happens when water, it turns really, really harmful. But the air permit, 
was issued separately from water quality permits. The building permits were separate from either the water quality or the air permits. All the things that had to do with emissions from the plant or the parking and so forth were regulated by the other. So we weren't treating this as one ball of wax. We were treating this as a lot of separate problems. It would be like going into the hospital and having somebody say, well, you know, we've got your uh, broken arm fixed, um, but we've ignored the fact of having a massive heart attack. Or we're giving this drug to help this, but it's actually going to make you brain dead. You know, you really have got to think about all these things in combination. And in fact, that's exactly what the lawsuits that help the Southern Environmental Law Center and the Riverkeepers Alliance were able to do. They were able to convince enough people, both in government and in the courts, that in fact, this is a ball of wax that's connected. And if you screw this stuff out, it winds up in the water, it goes downstream. Oh, what's downstream? Not much, just intakes for various drinking water. So, so we don't treat it as one thing. It brought up another really simple question. And one of the things I find in my writing, and I'm not a scientist, I'm not pretend to be, I'm not a historian, but I read about both quite often. And quite often they're connected. Um, I ask myself, what is a river? What is this river? And I kept on trying on definitions. The river is the channel that runs from Mermaid Point up the fairway past Ballhead Island and finishes at the seaboard. Yeah, but that's like saying that I-95 is a strip of concrete. It doesn't quite capture what goes on. And then you say, well, it's the water. You know what? The water is gone. The water goes 200 miles down the river and it's gone and more water is behind it. And it's never the same water. That old saying, you can't step into the same river twice. You can't. It's different. I said, okay, if it's not just the water, it's not just the channel, then what is it? Does it include the fish? Sturgeon and striped bass and alligator gar, prehistoric fish that have been rumored to be nine feet long, we caught in the 1800s. Does it include all the critters who live along the banks? If you go along the Cape Fear River, the biologist I traveled with, David Webster, literally wrote the book on mammals of the southeast of the United States. And so he was able to say, well, you see that? That is an otter slime. Here's why they're there. You see that? We had one point where he stopped on the sandbar, he dug up turtle nest for them. Because he had done his dissertation on turtle nesting animals. And then carefully covered them up to hide them from porcupines. And then he said, by the way, there are porcupine tracks. <laughs> and then he said, there's an animal here that you don't even know is here, but you'll never see him. It's the mink. The minks are all over the world here. And they're ferocious hunters. They're real, real have with hunters and eaters, but he said, you'll never see them. So I've been in the field for all these years. I've never seen them, not in the field, because they're really secretive and really sneaky. He said, coyotes, they're in the Cape Fear, just like they're in every one of 100 counties in North Carolina. Oops, they replaced the old, uh, there was a, an original cannon that lived on the Cape Fear Basin that was hunted to extinction back in probably 1700, and this was replaced. Black bears. We saw deer. We saw, I can't tell you how many bald eagles. We actually were coming down the little Raven Rock and we saw an osprey. Hey, an osprey, I don't know how big this man is probably bigger than this. He came flying down, looking like a dive bomber, grabbed a big fish. I mean, I'm talking about probably a six or seven pound striker. Throw it up, bald eagle came the other way, <laughs> hit him, and took the fish. Midair, <laughs> midair. We're, we're like in the canoes, just like, <laughs> like <laughs> the Washington's. eagle goes up, takes the fish, and the osprey's flying up, trying to get it. The eagle goes back to its eyrie, and the osprey's flying around the eyrie, and does that for a few minutes, and finally gets up and goes, there's the top of it, and there's the false sign. You could live for 100 years in that river and never see that. But the fact is, that goes on there every day on the side of humans. So on the river, does, does the river include all that? I would suggest yes. We counted something like 63 species of birds, almost one per mile, coming down between Mermaid Point and, uh, and uh, Fayetteville. And I always thought, okay, birds, they're sort of milling around, flying here and there, doing whatever you have, sprays and eagles, you know, vireos and warblers, and Louisiana water thrushes and what have you. And our birder with us, and David, the biologist, said, no, 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 look more carefully. I said, there's a lot of order going on here. So you have to think of the river in three dimensions. So three dimensions go up to a distance of several thousand feet. And up on that part, the 
still see the hawks and they'll see the ospreys and the eagles and they're the raptors and they're circling and they're looking in miles of river and they're flying up and down and they're looking for prey. And if you come down a bit, you see other, you see wood ducks and they're nesting in the trees, but they're off the ground here. You see the water thrushes and they're down closer to the ground. And you'll see them using, it's almost as if there's an air traffic control. They fly only a certain altitude, you'll be able to watch this after a while. You'll see the ones that skim the water and the wading birds that are right in the water. And then you see the ones that are medium height, the ones up here. And then um, Amy, our photographer, was picking out nesting pairs of the final three warblers. And they weren't just willy nilly, they were pretty much every hundred yards or so on both sides and they had their little territory staked out. So there was this completely complex and very orderly ecosystem of birds using the flyways above the Cape Fear River. And they had it all mapped out in the way that I've heard aeronautical or aerobatic pilots do, where they think of a box. It's going to blow any minute. <laughs> Taylor went to get Carl. When they, where they think of, of the flying space as a box, and when they move around in it, they're careful never to go outside of the box. Because if they go outside of the box, they'll crash, or they'll be in an airspace of another airplane. And you can, if you learn how to look, you can see the birds doing exactly that. And so it became an exercise in wonderment and seeing the tremendous order of this kind of spatial geography in the air that I had never thought of. It turns out that the river has its own weather. On a day when you're in Wilmington and you're standing on the shore downtown and you're a block away from the river and it's 85 degrees and there's not a breath of wind, if you go out on the river one block down and go out 50 feet into the river, it's suddenly 75 degrees and there's a brisk wind coming up the river. Because you know this, right? Water and land heat at different rates. All weather is caused by wind, all wind is caused by the transfer of heat. So you have a system that's essentially cooling this large swath of the interior and it's changing the weather pattern. And so you have these microclimates all down the river. So in the river, you might have a totally clear day, but early in the morning in the river, as we put off in our canoe, a mist so thick it was like going through silver air. It's like almost really deep. So is that the river? What about the floor of the river? The floor of the river used to be um, carpeted with mussels, and they were so thick that the early explorers said that they basically every 100 feet, they purified the entire river. There were so many of them. I think it's all of that. I also think it's the miles of wetlands on either side. So when you dredge the river, and we'll talk a little more about that later, down in the lower reaches, reach the port of Wilmington, and you dredge an extra two feet, four feet, six feet, you don't only deepen it, but when the tide comes up the river, it spreads out more, and it takes the salt water further up the river. So that by now, the salt water intrusion in the Cape Fear goes all the way from the sea buoy up to Lock and Dam number one, which is something like 35 miles away from Wilmington. It goes all the way up the northern branch, you get up northeast branch, almost as far as Queens. This is a long, long way. So you're, you're now making the river flow in two directions, which it didn't used to be. You used to have a, a very, very, when the settlers got there in the 1700s, even in the 1800s, the river probably had a very small tidal flow that might have reached Wilmington. And the bar of the Cape Fear River was probably around 12 feet, maybe 20 at the outside, around Town Creek, which is down below Wilmington. And that's all there that we're going to get to that. <coughs> so, is the river also the history of the river? And I would maintain maybe yes. I knew about a lot of things that happened on the river. I knew it was Fort Fisher, the big Civil War fort at the mouth of the River Garden. And by the way, there are eight other forts around the river. I knew that there was a fort there. I knew that Wilmington was where it was. I knew Fayetteville was where it was. I knew there had been plantations to slave all over, a very large concentration of 330,000 slaves in North Carolina in 1860, but down along the Cape Fear River, and what wasn't they were pretty much along the news and gone up there. And then I came to realize something. They weren't just there and they happened to be on the river. Pretty much everything that happened on the river was there because of the river. There were no roads. So when the first settlers came to the coast of North Carolina at that point, it came up the river. In fact, it was known for a while as the third. 
and the river became the way into the interior. The head of navigation of that river is what then though. Beyond that, the river turns into rapids and it's very hard to navigate. Although as we'll see in a moment, that didn't stop some people. So it turns out there's a natural highway between the I-95 of the 19th century. There was an incredible steamboat traffic between Smithville, now Southport, Wilmington, and Fayetteville. Many of the 85 boats that were landings every quarter of a mile. It was the way if you were courting somebody, you got a little steamboat. And they weren't gigantic Mississippi you know, Mark Twain boats. They were much smaller. They had initially one deck and later on two. And they might take you several days to get to Fayetteville because they were stopping. It was a local. It was not strict. But if you were taking your stuff to market, if you were buying a hog, if you're going to visit a relative, going to court someone, uh, what have you, you were just taking a business trip and you were getting a steamboat in there. The slaves were there because of the river. Plantations were located where? Well, you have to be able to access the land and get the goods out of the raw materials in. So I went on um, the lower river with him, the dead river keeper, one afternoon, and he steered me through the little canals. And anytime you see straight line, you know this in nature, it's not natural. And so when you, when you come down the river and you start seeing straight lines into these areas, you know what these are, are the access canals usually dredged out the concretes that were already there. And they were where the lighters took raw materials in the plantation, including slaves, considered raw material. And they then brought out the goods and reloaded them onto larger boats, either at Wilmington or at Smithville, and off they went. So the, the, the whole plantation culture, slave culture, and all that went with it, the reason why Wilmington, for example, became a majority black town in 1898, due to racial violence, was the river. And it's always a crowning irony that one of the enduring, I don't think it's a myth, I think it happened, though probably not in the numbers it was told, but um, in the violence of Wilmington in 1898, there were eyewitness accounts of bodies being dumped by the wagon over the river. The river. So the river comes up again, both in the folklore and the history of it. Fayetteville, as I said, is there, a mill town built on the river where they could get the So the history of it and the associated culture and all the political ramifications all are there because of the river. They just didn't happen to be there and the river happened to be there. They're all very much connected. So to me, the river exists as a kind of a palimpsest. You're probably most of you are too young to remember how we used to have the feet before we had all this fancy stuff. And we would have overhead projectors and you would have one layer, and another layer, another layer, another layer. And pretty soon you'd have 10 layers that you could see. I, I came to feel that way about the river. Three dimensional thing, but the red coats are still there and the early settlers are still there. If your Indians are still there, and all the people that have come since are still there, the Civil War armies, the shipbuilding of World War II, the steamboat captains that ran up to Fayetteville and back are still there. Um, to me, the river then becomes this very complex, dynamic living system. And it lives through time, it lives through space, it lives across what we think of as disciplines, science, humanities, history, whatever you want to call it. And it's this big, fascinating thing, but it's all one thing. And I would argue that if you can start to understand the river and what's happening along it, whether it's environmental issues like hog farms and concentrated chicken uh, operations, or whether it is some of the poor communities that have been left behind by the industrialization, or whether it is all the stuff that happened in history, you, you can start to figure out some things about who we are and why we are and what we might do going forward, uh, and start to make some links between both the river and policy. That is, if we start to understand where we are, why we're there, what happened to get us there, we can begin to figure out what might be some good moves going forward. I had a lot of discussions with some of the people I talked to today about the intersection of science and policy. And the point I was making for many of them was this. If you're writing about science, you're writing about something that has at its base something really factual, hard, good, reliable information gotten by the old-fashioned way of observation, experimentation, checking data, counting things, all the things scientists have to do to get a reliable picture of what's in the world. But it's like that's the center lobby and all these doors go off on it. And one door is the history of how we use that information. Another is the philosophy of how If we can do genetic, um, uh, if we can use genetic, um, there's a, I'm trying to remember the name, there's a new tool that they've just, I think it's called a CRISPR, yes. If we can use that to do genetic modification, the question then becomes ethically should we? 
And then the, the question is, if we do it, who should we do it to and who should pay for it? And what's the larger issue in terms of the good or ill that we do to society? So if you start with the basic science, I said that's kind of a, a rotunda in the lobby. And all these doors go off in the other directions. And I would argue that as a scientist, if you are such, you're uniquely positioned to be able to talk to the lay audience with some authority and say, let me explain to you what we mean by whatever it is, global warming, sea level rise, coal ash dumping in the river. One of the things that concern us as citizens. You know, why should you care? I tell a story, Kemper Dick, uh, who is a river keeper in one thing. And by the way, go on the Rachel Maddow show on YouTube and Google Take Care of the River Rachel Maddow. Uh, the coal ash spill, it wasn't really a spill, which I get to, made it on the Rachel Maddow show. It's actually a delivery company by the Canadian people. It's even from an airplane on video tape, putting the uniform with their truck all night with the big thing to roll over. It made the Rachel Maddow show. But he would take people on the river and he would say, you know, you really have to think about clean water. And like, yeah, yeah, clean water. It's a pretty river. Water and no matter what argument he made, he would always come back, yeah, yeah that's all nice, but that's nature and all that. But then he said, let me take you somewhere else. And he would take them up to the intake to the city of Rome. And he would say, can you get it? And you're like, what's that thing? That goes from there to stick it where you so if when you were in Wilmington today and you got a pina colada and you put ice cubes in it, that's where the ice came from. You know, you had a jug of iced tea, that's where the water came from. You know, if you had a couple of aspirin and you had a headache and you sluiced it down from the water fountain, that's where the water came from. So maybe we should do it. Because you're putting it into your own body. And by the way, one of the one of the realizations I made of why I wanted to do the book was if it's true that you actually do replace your cells every what, nine years or something. Then I mean, I'm all keep your river. Okay, so a simple point, but I think kind of an important one. Even something as dumb and not dumb as the people involved in the Battle of Morse Creek was a battle about a bunch of Scots tourists from Fayetteville trying to get across tributary of the Cape Fear River in order to advance from Wilmington, and another group that tried to stop them from getting across the river. So, any way you look at it, you know, the river is so crucial to what happened when General Sherman invaded North Carolina. When they had Bill, he didn't just pick it idly off the map. 995 was there. He went there, he figured out his block. There was another Union army in Wilmington that had just taken Fort Fisher, and they could now supply his army by steamboat right up to get the river, which they proceeded to do. And by the way, he could water his 10,000 mules and 4,500 cattle horses. That's kind of a pretty good thing. Hey. Uh, the second thing is, um, I learned to question all those things we take for granted that I think we know for sure. So when the Army Corps came in and said, you know, it's, it's a really good thing, unqualified goods would bridge this river and make it available for traffic. And they did, they bridged it to 26 feet and then 32. I think it's up to 46 or 48 feet now. They won't take it to 52 feet. Perfect. You can get big ships in. I'll show you a couple of pictures of them. But what happens then is saltwater intrusion. So you get let the lens of salt goes further and further up the river. Why do we care? Well, all those beautiful cypress trees are dying off. But they can't live in salt water. All those wonderful wading birds like the white ibis who colonize the Cape River Islands now have to fly further and further from their nests to get non-salt water larvae, non-salt water crayfish to be able to feed their young who can't tolerate salt. So what do they do? They leave the river and nest further away from the river. So now some of them are gone. And on and on. And the other thing is, you have saltwater intrusion all the way up to block and dam number one. So you don't have the ability for surgeon to do anything. They can't do their spawning in saltwater. They have to get further up river. They can't, there's a dam there. When they decided to use DDT in the, 19, the event of the 1940s, I believe, they used it in certain parts of the Pacific Theater because it's great at uh, killing the vectors of disease, like mosquitoes. Um, turned out, and they loved, they thought it was like the miracle cure. Some scientists actually went and, you know, on TV and screwed it into the mouth saying, see, it's DDT, it's harmless. But as you know, it's a bioaccumulator. So generations down the line, it turned out birds were being, uh, were, were not making proper shells and they were dying out. The California condorous is a famous example. On the Cape Fear River and in North Carolina, the brown pelican was almost extinct. There were 100 breeding pairs on Okokok Island offshore. That was it. And so, um, and this is what I love. Another thing I learned to love about this story was 
as I said to some of you, I don't like dead fish documentaries. I don't like this thing that God provides a mess and then they all go get drunk or something. <laughs> we about it or turn on cartoons or whatever, too. I like to see where we made a difference. Okay, so Titan Cement, they're gone. They're off the road. They're not going to do it. I didn't get to see them in the whole part of the Northeast Bank. When Jim Parnell, who at that time was a young researcher at my university, University of North Carolina Wilmington, he decided he didn't like what was going on. They had stopped using DDT, but the ground polythene was still gone. So he very quietly got together with the Army Corps of Engineers, a couple other researchers, and some underpaid starving graduate students like yourselves. And they began making deals to build spoil islands in the river so they could create nesting pairs. And now there are something like 10,000 nesting pairs now. And by the way, there are also bird refuges all over the state that we have right now because he proceeded to expand the network and help to bring back species of all kinds. So that was another way. When Cape Fear River Watch uh, director Judd Springer, who was the original river, not the original, but the second river keeper, saw that the lock and dam was keeping the sturgeon and stripers from getting upstream to spawn, and, and the fishery, which had been very robust until the last year, gone. So the local fishery was devastated. They worked out a deal. It turned out that the Army Corps had done some things they shouldn't have done when they dredged the Cape Fear River too deeply. And so there was some reparation money that they had to pay to mitigate the damage. They took this money and some other money and made a very complicated deal. The bill was called Rock Arch Rack, which is locking them on, which means that instead of having a dam, fish can't get over, they created stair steps with boulders and resting pools so that the, the sturgeon and the bass could jump up a little bit, rest, jump up a little bit, rest, and get up river away from salt and spawn, and the fishery is not coming back. And they have got the preliminary funding and plans to do nothing. So one message is that a few people sitting around a dining room table on a Saturday afternoon with a chair can actually do something important, even though it might take a while and might have to be patient. But I think the Titan River or the Titan Cement organization, TitanStopTitan.org, I believe the woman who started that was 22 years old. She was a university student. She just would not give up. She's one of the fiercest people we've ever met. She just would not give up. And it took, I think, five years altogether or longer before she finally gave with the help of a lot of other people. So that one message is, yeah, we can do some. Um, and then before I show you some slides, maybe the last thing that I'll tell you is I think quite remarkable to me. I didn't know. We'd always heard Fayetteville was the head of navigation. It turns out that in the 19th century, just before the Civil War, engineers working for the Cape Fear Lock and Dam Company with various, had various names and sold several times. Cape Fear and Deep River Navigation Company and so forth. They actually were able to take steamboats all the way from Wilmington to Mont Fury, which is above Monday. Think about that. It took them a long time to get up there. They had to go over rapids. But as we came down the river, I was joking with you, you see David Webster, and um, I, I joked with him that we hit every rock in the river. And we, were, we also saw all kinds of debris in the river, but we kept on coming across the lines of boulders, very square lines of boulders, very square boulders. And I said, David, this can't possibly be natural. I mean, some of them were ledges and work, but there were also things that had been deliberately set across the river. And they went back to the 18th century attempts at navigating the river, creating mill races essentially of deep water on one side or the other, blocking off the rest of the river, to let the dam it up and make those things of whatever else it was. And downriver, they actually had veins which were slanted downriver so that the current would have to sluice through those. And of course, you know, physics is going to a smaller area, so it's going to then pick up speed and become more powerful, and it would actually scour out the bottom. And so around Town Creek, these primitive wooden veins would direct the water, and they could actually create a channel that was much deeper than the original bar had. So the, the river has been engineered one way or another from offshore far beyond the seaway, all the way around Bald Head Island, Oak Island, Southport, all the way up past the Port of Wilmington, where the training basin is, all the way up through Wilmington, all the way up under the various bridges, and on up to Fayetteville, where it was dredged to a depth of, I think, 12 feet for many years, and all the way up to Montefiore. And there's a dam way up at Wilmington. I don't know if people realize that Montefiore is like 20 years old. Yeah, yeah. You, we're, we're not far, actually, from the headwaters. We're part of that what drains in the basin. So before there was a Jordan Lane, right, there was just all the stuff that came into Cape Fear. And, and this little place called Montefiore, which 
and they, there was a plan at some point to turn into a great entrepreneur. And there were all sorts of politicians involved in selling off property and got them to go there. But it, it's true, they got steamboats all the way up the hill and they brought them all the way back. And then railroads came along and the whole project became just business. So even though that is true, and even though in the old days, you know, Fayetteville was wiped out several times by floods, um, the whole section in here about the bridges that were washed out, the Lillington Bridge was washed out several times. Uh, there was a time when um, it was washed out with cars actually crossing it. And so the river was wild, and the tradition of people living along the river, places like Lillington and Fayetteville, was if you were rich enough to get away from the river. And the poor people were the first to drown. Because periodically there was what they called fresh, and the river just came down. All that rain in the Piedmont just came right down the river and washed it away. The Jordan Lake was supposed to change all this. The Low Jordan Lake, if you come down the, the hall and the deep come together at a place called Lemonade Point, which I talked about, there's a dam right below that that's no longer used for the power plant that once was powering, but it's now there's a nuclear plant that it's a basin for. Uh, and then all the way down, there's Lockett Dam, three, two, one. And all that you get to the dredge part, and you get to the port of Wilmington, and on and on. Even though that's true, the river resists it. The river is still a very wild thing, which is why I named the book down the wild thing. Because when you're on the river, we actually camped above Fayetteville on a cobble bar, which is exactly like a sandbar, except it's made out of rock. I don't want to sleep on it. I forgot to bring the pad like I did. And we, we were, as we were, we're, we're coasting, we got there, we're fine, we're having wine. Let's have a big bowl of pasta and a sausage. And we're talking about what heroes we are from the town and down the river so far. Well, it begins to rain. And we're standing under a lone river cypress, and we're, you know, about that far up from the river top for a little stand about cobble. And this is fun until the lightning starts. Great kind of blue veins of lightning. And then the wind picks up and the rain gets harder and we're like, oh, we better make a defense. And so we did. But of course, all night long. I didn't do this because I left it up to the expedition leader. He's, he's, he's sort of an outdoorsy type guy, but he was getting up every 15 minutes all night long to make sure that we weren't being flooded out because the river came up at seven or eight inches in the night, which meant it covered most of the bar. We were up on a little bench above it, probably about the height of that, uh, that counter there. And then, of course, when we paddled out in the morning, the current was way faster than so even though we had the Jordan Dam regulating, even though there's the Buckhorn Dam, even though there, all that engineering, it's still a wild river. Okay, so let me show you some slides and then I'll take any questions about that. Go ahead. Okay, so this is the great book here. You can barely refer to it. It's a joke. <laughs> And, and the word heart, by the way, is chosen advisedly. It really does feel like the art or something at the heart of what's going on. This is Buckhorn Dam, and it doesn't look like much, but one of the things I do in the early chapter of the book is to give you the death toll of Buckhorn Dam, the various people that died, uh, workers building it. Uh, when they built the power plant there, it was struck by lightning. Many people were dead. Of course, went nuts and went running off. There was a boat that went over the dam at one point. And if you see the dam, you create a, if you know a little bit about hydrology, you create a hydrology of that. If you go over that dam, which doesn't look like it's 12 feet, but it is, and you get stuck in that white water at the bottom, you'll never get out. You have to go to one side of the river or the other, and it's going to be awfully hard to do that and still stay alive. Because it's so regular. But what happens is the water comes down, and it just keeps on doing this for a while. I'll show you a little bit of an example of that in a moment. Okay, I, I like to do this. Video in this. <laughs> this is me paddling the upper reach, coming actually onto the upper end of Buckhorn Dam. And I actually paddled that last section alone after I'd done the rest of the entire river. So we originally put in a Buckhorn Dam all the way down to the sea over the course of many months. And I came up and took my kayak up. And came off the deep river and came down low to finish the journey and to kind of create a circle. It wasn't, I didn't start out intending to do that, but it turned out to be the perfect one. There we are, 
we have to we, we took a month probably for our eyes, but that's David. Mm -hmm. We put everything in those canisters and roped them in with scrape and put over here several times. Uh, Ethan River Guy. I had some graduate students and we paid them to take the cars back down. It was sort of like a deliverance thing where this thing never <laughs> go main three. That's Amy, she was Ethan's wife and our photographer. And she was a uh, an amazing bird, and I was surprised. We were in Raven Rock, camped out, and we hear this <laughs> and screech out, right? And it's not very far away, and we're terrified. It sounds like a wind machine. And Amy's like, oh my gosh, it's a great screech out. So she gets on her phone, dials up her little app, and starts answering the little screech owl app. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what's going to happen next? And oh, he's probably going to come here and try to attack me because I'm just staring for my phone. Like, oh, you're <laughs> This is the warning sign, and I think this is probably a reference to um, not so much the river as in this is a nuclear plant nearby. <laughs> that gives you an idea of how high Buckhorn Dam actually is. You know, we're, we're probably 150 or 200 yards in front of it. Look how high it is. The, the Grumman canoe in the back, well, the kind of all the colored one, aircraft aluminum, yeah, indented every rock in the river. <laughs> this, one of the things that happens, you get on the river and you realize you're not that far from gigantic cities, and yet you feel like this could be the new time delta. It feels like you're out of the wilderness, and, and for a long time, because you can't get any cell phone coverage, you're very much back in the 19th century. Very early in the morning, it's a little bit of mist there. Okay, this is an example of one of the man made. We did a thing which we weren't supposed to do. We went to come alongside the river. This turns out to be an old mill race here. What had been, I think, a logging uh, sawmill. So we, we saw this, and it was fun to go down there. And we just kept going. And we said, oh, wait a second, it's starting to boil a little bit here. And we started hitting rocks. More, and we're like, oh, that's me going, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're going to start our, our first day out, go, wait a second, what did I sign on here for? Okay, then we, we got stuck on a rock. And then we're back in, and then the water gets deeper again, and off we go. And then we're going, and we, we can't quite tell, but we've probably gone a quarter of a mile or more. I can go there for a mile of it. And then it's a, and we're all wet because we're getting splashed all the time, which apparently class is classified as a class. And then there's David. <laughs> so that's easy. We, Floating in the river at certain points, uh, one of the many bald eagles we saw. We're paddling. And here we are coming into um, so just above Raven Rock. So we're going to go into hydraulic here in a minute. What we did was unload the canoe and then run his light canoe down. We put everything in the rock and then came back. And then we came back up here. And now we're serving the hydraulic. So then the water is thundering down there and we are that's completely stationary. All he's doing is a steering paddle and we can go straight. And then we get wet. And this is the foot out in Raymond Rock and the stairs. Uh, this, this is where the fall of the river occurs. So you have a base drop off from um, what's essentially a mountain stream, but you have the Piedmont stream, and now you're on close to the bent inside the visitor center. Tells you a bit about that. And then we start coming in. One of the interesting things in the river is you go along and along and along, you see nothing. Uh, very few people, a few catfish, fishermen here and there. Uh, very few other people in the river. And then suddenly you hear an event and there's a gigantic human made special bridge coming down the river. And it's always a surprise. So I'm coming in a bit, a little couple of couple of bridges there, highway bridges. And then sort of the detritus of the traffic on the river. You see maybe it's called Titanic on that little pump. So we're all shipping and handling.
and then like here we are uh, we were we're going to be in Fayetteville and we're not very far from one of the largest military bases on the planet and 100,000 people who live in the city of Fayetteville but you would never know and you could live in Fayetteville your whole life and unless you go down Person Street you never run another river it, it, it's so uh, if you're living there, the homeless camp in the is there, that's under the kind of person's speech. This is a kind of a sad commentary. That's the old crane that served what would have been the municipal dock at Fayetteville, which was completed just in time for the railroads to make it obsolete. And so it was left, some days it's going to crash it down, probably about a 40 ton crane. Way the river. And then that's the only thing down below the river with the water. This is a little uh, cable ferry, no well crossing. You can see how small it is. In the 40s, it actually blew up, killing one of the original brothers, and they were convinced they could not descend it. Well, someone wanted to know why they were not here by the wall here. So here we switch to a little power boat we borrowed from the uh, new science program. Now we're going into lots of dams. Just a, a, a very simple design, hand, hand cranks. And then we lower you or raise you up to the level of the space of the now the level of the lower. And then that's the original falls of the log. And here's where we uh, stopped to look at turtle eggs. Some of the few fishermen that we saw on the river. And you can, again, you, you're always struck, or I was always struck by just how beautiful and remote the river was, even though we were often passing close to town and to the line place. And then we get down toward the lower river and we start to get to an old uh, chemical dock. And this is the old power plant. Those stacks are coming down because they're already down at this point. But it was a coal power fire plant that's now been converted to clean burning gas for coal ash probably. And that's the old river in Nevada. Nevada, after the war, Civil War became the economic driver for Wilmington. They figured out they could bring fertilizer in from the islands of the Caribbean. Uh, I'm sorry, bird dropping the Caribbean fertilizer. So that's what we did. Those started the Fergus Ark, which you can see the battleship North Carolina with the steam ward across there. Fergus Ark was long gone. When the battleship was towed into position, it hit. Fergus Ark restaurant and almost sink it. <laughs> so for years, the Fergus Ark floating restaurant had a sign that said, No restaurant ever could be struck by a US Navy vessel. <laughs> <laughs> this gives you an idea of the old liberty ships that were built here before. Uh, launching day of the uh, excursion boats. James Front was probably the richest man on the Cape Fear. He owned the Hampton Town Press and became the International cotton distributor for the world. I always want to know what that book did go with all the people that were there. The water, the original waterfront in Wilmington was right downtown for the markets. I think. Christine, a liberty ship in the war, floating dry dock. More than 10,000 people worked at the shipyard during the war. That was interesting because it was something like a third of the workforce was African American. They were often in very skilled jobs with one of the more desegregated things. This is the working plantation originally settled by King Roger Moore, who came up from Charleston. This, you might recognize this from the movie Firestarter. Uh, when when uh, Dina De Laurentiis wanted to make that movie on the Stephen King novel, which came to Wilmington because somebody had seen this, I think it was Southern Living Magazine, and they built an exact replica of it and burned it down. <laughs> but it began the film industry in Wilmington. So the plantation finally contributed something besides uh, price. The chapel, 
My wife didn't hold it. <laughs> she was mad. I took a picture with her. And that's just one of the one of the things King Roger Moore is famous for is wiping out the lands of Cape Fear Indians. Cypress that's there dying off that's all the period in the grave of Roger Moore and the rest. That's no longer open, by the way, because it's been bought by one of the descendants of the Imperial Roger Moore. And he's trying to restore it what it looked like in the 18th century, but it's no longer open. Because we're born in the last days of those days. That's looking out onto the river. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see an alligator down there in the, the middle. Actually, I didn't see it until my wife pointed it out after we crossed it. I said, Did you see that gator? I said, Who's the gator? <laughs> this is another example of what we know for sure. Cypress means they're all kind of theories about what they actually do. And finally, the scientists I talked to basically said, Well, actually, we don't really know. So it was a theory that they provided oxygen into the ecosystem of the cypress trees. The old Archer Daniels Midland dot. We're heading down river now. This I like. You're looking past the eagle to Eagles Island, which I like. You can see the stars or whatnot. But this one I really like here. The juxtaposition of the gigantic crane that the Port of Rome is in is even better picture. Yeah, there it is. So you're looking at the 19th century technology on the ship back to the 21st century of the thing. And Frank was my guy down the He's a cosmic diver and pilot. Notice cut connects the intercoastal with the river. When it was originally built, there was some fear that um, the water coming between the river and uh, uh, basically the inlet and the sea would create a vortex. It would be extremely dangerous and they would have to build a lot. But then they did it and nothing happened. And this was the, the day we were there on the lower river. It was like a huge everything. So it was a bread that day. This bunch of cute crews was out that day. I think that's Fort Caswell. You know, weather were very there. Um, but our boat was out doing something. Uh, the ferry was busy crossing. The pilots were getting ready to go out. Two people were not there, they see the port. But the Dan and Moore was the Cape Fear Community College boat was already headed out. And another one of our UNCW boats was doing water sampling. Oh, and that's my little yacht. Mm -hmm. That's a boat that often visits the port and was standing out to see. And then finally, we'll go to the White House. Now we're past go and collect the So thanks for listening, but I'd love to take your question in the time we have left. You mentioned that uh, you sort of touched on something about like a, a you know, data system for the data and all these other people too about specifically things like canals yeah. being built, you know, exclusively pretty much for civil slave labor, and that that was even one of the slave labor sort of considered the dirtiest worst work. Yeah. Canals clearing land in the swamps and stuff. I'm curious how much that is remembered or forgotten. You know, within the areas where that actually happens. It gets remembered. You have to remember that, among other things, the people you're reading.